In order to get this 286 motherboard running, I need a way to boot, either from floppy or a hard drive interface, but the motherboard doesn't have an onboard disk controller, so I decided to make my own by using an open source and hardware floppy disk controller project with the help of today's sponsor, PCBWay. I found this project on GitHub, and it has two onboard floppy controller chips, a serial port, and the necessary boot ROM to add support for up to eight floppy drives. Jumpers control whether the boot ROM, serial port, and each floppy controller are enabled, along with other configuration options like IRQ and DMA channels. I didn't change anything on the design at all, I just took the Gerber files straight from GitHub and use those to order from PCBWay. Since this card has an edge connector, it's recommended to use some sort of gold plating. So before even using the Gerbers, if I just enter a board size of 100 by 100 millimeters, and the flat rate would be $5, just as an example, if this board has an edge connector, we would say yes here, and then we have all kinds of options here, including hard gold, which is a thicker, more durable gold plating. But suddenly $5 jumps to almost $300 for 10 boards. So if we just go with much thinner immersion gold, it's a more manageable $47 for the thinnest, or it gets more expensive as we add more gold. So I just went with the thinnest gold, and also being a plug-in expansion card, the edge should have some sort of bevel on it for easier insertion, and the options we have here are 20, 30, or 45 degrees. But I noticed something. If I just use the quick order and upload the Gerbers that we're actually ordering, there's the actual design. So when I enable edge connectors, suddenly I don't even have as many options, so still immersion gold, and the beveling only allows 30 degrees. I'm not sure why, but I wasn't too worried, so I just ordered it like this, and I kept all the other parameters default, including board thickness, 1.6 millimeters. That's okay for a standard PC 8 or 16-bit expansion card. I've never designed anything like this for an expansion card, so, just glancing at the schematic on GitHub from a high-level view, here's the 8-bit bus on the motherboard with all of its data, address, and other control signals. We'll zoom in after, but basically, here's two duplicate circuits for the floppy disk controller first and second chips. It just goes directly to the data and address lines on this card and has other derived control signals like a chip select to give this chip control of the bus at any given time, and the output pretty much goes straight to the floppy headers, and there's some pull-up resistors here. So there's really not much to the floppy controller, it's all on chip, so whichever chip is being addressed will have control of the bus. Otherwise, here's the BIOS ROM, and likewise 8-bit data bus and some address pins and chip select stuff connecting up to the main computer bus. And here's the serial port. We have the 16C550 UART chip connecting to data and address. And it has an RS-232 level translator chip so that all of these UART transmit, receive, DTR, DSR, and such get switched over to proper RS-232 voltages and go to the 9-pin serial port on the back of the card. So zooming in here, some of these address lines here get decoded from the bus, and when the right combination of addresses are selected, you end up with a chip select for the UART or floppy disk controller 1 or 2 chips. So that's how they get enabled based on what the computer wants to have happen. The ROMs have their data and address on the bus, and control lines for chip select and memory access. Similar thing with the serial port, it all just ties into the bus, has some control lines. Otherwise, it's not much different than wiring something up to an Arduino. There is a detailed bill of materials on the GitHub page, including Mauser part numbers for easy ordering of anything available there, and there's information for alternate part numbers in case you can't get the primary part. I was able to get some of these parts on AliExpress and the rest I got on Mauser. I couldn't get this main floppy disk controller chip, so looking at the possible replacements, I was able to get this 
first option of the National Semiconductor chip on AliExpress. I decided it looks like these are listed in order of preference, and the further down the list you go, you may have options not supported, so this worked out okay. And for the Flash ROM, you can either populate U5 or U6. They're both occupying the same physical space on the board, so you just put one or the other. And they are recommending to use this Flash ROM, but I bought both of these just in case I had problems with one or the other, and this one is working out fine for me. When the board is assembled, this ROM needs to be programmed with the BIOS. So it can be programmed standalone on a separate programmer, but I don't have one. So it also can be programmed in circuit when the card is plugged in using a DOS flash utility. And the firmware file and the flash utility are linked from this page. So when setting the jumpers, we need to make sure we enable BIOS in the first place and that we enable writing to that ROM. We also need to set jumpers for the start address for this ROM code. And since it looks like there could be a conflict using this first available address, I just went with the next one. So then we would install the card, download the floppy BIOS file, and the flash utility to get that file into the card. On each of these four floppy connectors, up to two drives can be supported on each connector. And I may not need to run up to eight drives, but I may need to run four if I want two three and a halfs and two five and a quarter drives. If I only used one controller to try and control a total of four floppies, two on each cable, depending on the kind of cable and the location and position of the drives, I may not be able to physically plug in four floppies on these two connectors. But if I had a dedicated cable for each drive, worst case, I could definitely get all four running and route the cables as needed. This here is the first floppy controller. So the drives here would be zero and one and then drives two and three would be on the other connector. Similarly, on the second floppy controller, it drives zero and one again, and drives two and three. So if we're using a single cable with two drives on it, the first drive is going to be the one at the farthest end of the cable, and the second drive on that cable is the one in the middle of the cable. In order to flash the BIOS in the ROM, I need to be able to use this card in a system with some sort of a drive, and I can't use the 286 because I don't have any drives. So I had to put the flash utility and the BIOS file on a bootable floppy, and I put the card in a 486 so I could power up and get the card flashed. I had renamed the BIOS file, so I ran the flash utility using my file name and specifying the memory location I set on the jumpers, and it was successful. So now it was time to put the card in the 286 and continue configuring the floppies. And here's how I have all the jumpers configured right now. So I'm enabling both floppy controller channels and I'm going to enable a serial port at address 2E8. I'm using IRQ5 for that second floppy drive controller, DMA channel 2 for the second floppy controller, IRQ7 for the serial port, and I've enabled the BIOS and the ability to write to it so I can configure it. And since I'm using this 39SF010 ROM, I've enabled that with these jumpers and I configured the start address of the ROM here. Now that the floppy BIOS has been flashed into the card, I'm going to move over to this 286 motherboard. This has no onboard peripherals at all, no serial, no parallel port, and I have a video card plugged in, but nothing else. So when I power it on, obviously it can't boot, and it's trying to boot from a floppy. I don't even have a floppy configured in the BIOS on the motherboard, and no serial port, obviously. No hard drives, no parallel port. And I have a total of four floppy drives available. A three and a half, a five and a quarter, and then two more three and a halves. So these two here are going to be drive A and B on a single cable going to one channel on the card. This will be drive C going on its own cable, and this is drive D going on its own cable. So I'll have three different cables talking to four drives going to this card. 
In order to configure the card, we have to press F2 at the right time while booting up to get into the BIOS configuration, and once in there, I accessed the help menu to see the list of commands, and I enabled both floppy controllers and anything else that seemed to be needed, including the serial port, and I was prompted for confirming the IRQ and DMA channels that I had set on the jumpers, so I entered those when asked. And the last thing I did once I told the card everything I want to use on it, I had to tell it how many floppy drives I want to use and where they are on those headers. In order to add a drive, it prompts for a physical and a logical drive number assignment, and it wants to know the size of floppy drive and the capacity. I'll be using both 3.5 inch 1.44 meg and 5 and a quarter 1.2 meg floppies. And then when I boot it up, BIOS assigned the drive letters A, B, C, and D in the order that I expected based on where I plugged them in, and I was able to use all four drives. Now with the three floppy drive cables plugged in and booting up, so it's looking for a boot disk, but I do have the serial port at 2E8 on this card. Of course, I need a boot disk, so I'll put that in drive A, and any key, and we have booted up. So if I take a look at the contents on that floppy, there it is. And now we can access drive B, C, and D. So if I just try listing the directory on B, obviously it'll wait for a disk, so I'll abort. And I happen to have this Adlib sound card jukebox application on five and a quarter. Have to move this out of the way. Now I'll repeat trying to look at what's on drive B. There's all the files on the Adlib floppy. If I just clear the screen now, I put a disk in drive C and D. Look at C contents. There's drive C and the contents on drive D. So let's see if I go to drive D, copy ANSI.sys to drive C. Now I have that file over there. So everything seems to be working. Now I'm up and running on the 286, and I can work on trying to get a hard drive interface running on it. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this project, and thanks to the creator of this GitHub project for making it available as an open source, open hardware project.